West Clark Jr. Welcome to TYT Interviews. Today we're going to be joined by Tom Risen, a technology and business reporter who's got a very background with a lot of publications and who has written extensively on pollution, water, and desecration of Native American lands. Tom, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Good, good. But yes, there's uh, this uh, major protest uh, movement against the Dakota Access Pipeline that uh, tomorrow there's going to be more than 100 events in about 35 states, including here in D.C. There's going to be one right in front of the White House where Bernie Sanders is uh, expected to make an appearance. And uh, tribes like the Standing Rock Sioux have been protesting it for months because they say it would endanger their main supply of drinking water and it would desecrate sacred burial ground sites near their reservation. To, to go into the details of it, and we'll, we'll get back to the protests and everything else, can we go around the background a little bit of, of why Native American tribes might not trust the federal government or rulings in terms of how to uh, take care of their own land? Yes, well, uh, the Standing Rock uh, Sioux said that they weren't properly consulted in the planning of the Dakota Access Pipeline, and so they sued the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a judge, last Friday, ruled against them, to their injunction seeking to stop the construction of the pipeline. Uh, but the Obama administration did vote, um, said, uh, step in and say they wanted to stop parts of the construction that would go uh, underneath the Missouri River, a lake near the river that would endanger their water supply. So they're going to review that part of it. But some of the, uh, yeah, they had this legacy of distrust against the government because uh, these reservations, like the San Yamaksu Reservation, used to be a lot larger. And uh, over the decades, the Army Corps of Engineers um, and other uh, government agencies took land from the, the tribal governments. And uh, uh, so, you know, their, land, their reservation lands have been reduced. They're worried that they're not getting enough support that they need from the government for things like poverty and water cleanliness. So this, uh, this has been a big focal point for all these decades <laughs> of resentment against the government. But a couple points just off what you've said. Is, are the goals of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe that there's no pipeline access across the reservation or simply underneath this one lake? Uh, they want to stop the uh, construction of the pipeline near their reservation. It wouldn't go through the reservation. It would go within a mile of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, and it would, uh, as proposed, go uh, underneath a lake that feeds into the Missouri River, which is their main uh, source of drinking water. They use it for livestock, for agriculture, for drinking water, and uh, they also uh, say that it would desecrate sacred burial ground sites. You know, my, my next question is, how can the Army Corps of Engineers violate treaties that we already have uh, with indigenous nations and simply take back land from the reservation that was given to them in treaty? Uh, they, uh, this, was, this happened back in the 1950s, and they built dams in the, uh, from the Missouri River over land that was uh, once part of the St. Rock Sioux Reservation. I think the, I'm not entirely sure how they see the land, but the St. Rock Sioux has said in their uh, criticism that this was land that was once theirs, and they, uh, you know, there wasn't uh, proper cons consultation with the tribal government about how this pipeline was going to be built. And, and to go back, and so so essentially, the Standing Rock Sioux are saying, listen, this pipeline, even if it doesn't cross our land, it's endangering our water, and that's reason enough to stop it. Yes, yes. Which, uh, a lot of um, environmental which, protesters are worried about that, too. And now, but let's also look at the record of the federal government and the EPA with other Indian tribes and their water and the safety of their drinking water. How is that? <laughs> Well, uh, the Navajo have had a particularly bad history with that. Um, there, in the early 20th century, uh, mining companies went on uh, southwest reservation lands and they dug for uranium. And the companies did not do a very good job of cleaning up the uranium mines. So the radiation seeped into the groundwater and contaminated generations of people. There is a disease named after the victims called Navajo neuropathy, and some people die of it for, in their teenage years because it's a radiation sickness. It can really, yeah, it, it causes all kinds of sickness. And uh, so recently, when there was a, a mining spill that the EPA was uh, deemed responsible for, you know, failing to prevent, the uh, Navajo were suspicious about that, and so the, the Navajo Nation has uh, sued the EPA for because they claim that uh, the emergency response to the mining spill wasn't enough. Now, this mining spill was the one, was this the one last spring in Colorado where the river turned yellow? 
It was last August. It was last August. Yes, okay. it was. Um, the Colorado River uh, was poisoned by the gold King <laughs> mine spill. It turned the river yellow with tex- toxic chemicals. And uh, state governments in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona have all, uh, you know, criticized and sought uh, to be made whole from the EPA about this because the government review deemed that the EPA was responsible, and the EPA has been doing something. Uh, to compensate state governments, to compensate the tribal governments, but the Navajo Nation says that it isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Now, on, among other tribal nations in the U.S., are they also suffering from these same infrastructure problems when it comes to clean water and the safety of their environment? Yes, yes. There's a, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of neglect over the decades. It's gotten better since the 1970s. Uh, Native Americans have gotten better at uh, asserting their rights. At uh, holding companies accountable, getting more aid from the government. But, uh, like, I spoke with a woman who lives in the Alaskan village of Kivalina, and she said she doesn't have a toilet. She lives in this uh, this Alaskan village where almost nobody has uh, clean water, and uh, she has to bag up her waste and drive it to a landfill because she does not have a toilet. And people who live there have a high rate of sickness. There are bad colds and flus, and there's all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, that's an, an extreme example but there are a wide range of clean water and sanitation challenges on the reservations. Well, I, Alaska aside, I, I nearly, I used to put up wind turbines and I almost did a contract for a, a village that was in the Arctic Circle. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with how bare bones people have got it up there. And a, a lot of it is, it's a question of, you know, power, uh, electrical generation and infrastructure and can it run these systems. But down here in the lower 48, I mean, you know, when you go to a lot of reservations in New Mexico or Colorado or the Dakotas, these people are not taken care of. And the U.S. is not fulfilling its treaty obligations to a large extent with these tribes. Yeah, I, I spoke with the EPA about this. It's, it's becoming more nuanced because uh, a few decades ago, absolutely, it would be easy to say that there wasn't enough aid. In recent years, there has been more. Uh, you know, the tribal governments say that they need more help. They say that the government needs to do more. It would be too, it would be simplistic to say that things would be better if there was more funding to a system, but it's becoming more nuanced because it's about the effectiveness of the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. It's about, yeah, it's about, you know, the help on the ground and, uh, you know, more, more money would help, but it's getting to that point where we have to look at just what is the right way to help the, the tribal governments. Yeah, because, you know, in the article, uh, I read that you've written that the U.S. government uh, have pledged $100 million. And this is just about the Navajo, to deal with the problem of the Navajo. But, you know, I think you said there were 1,238 families that that $100 million is supposed to cover, as well as clean up and take care of people. And, and you know, uh, I've been in the emergency room, and I can tell you, not getting cancer or radiation poisoning, just a, a standard operation is going to run $80,000, $90,000 for a person. And if you take 1,238 families and that $100 million, you've sucked down that money before you've built anything. Yeah, yeah, and the EPA has been seeking more money for uh, clean water programs, and uh, yeah, it's all about, you know, how effective would this money be? You know, you have to spread it across a lot of people who are affected by these problems, like the radiation poisoning. Mm -hmm. And where do you see these pipeline protests ending? Because I, I honest, I think more is happening than just this particular pipeline, at least in people's minds, as to what needs to go on. Yeah, like uh, the success, the environmental protesters' success against the Keystone Pipeline last year really emboldened them. So that's one reason there's been so much advocacy against this. Uh, there's, it's just something people understand. Uh, even uh, the cast of the upcoming Justice League movie has come out against the Dakota Access Pipeline. There's, this is something that people understand. And uh, because the Keystone Pipeline was such an issue for so long, and it, it kind of resembles it because the Keystone Pipeline would run would have run through some northern states, and the Dakota Access Pipeline would also run through some northern states. It would go to Dakota, oil, um, North Dakota oil fields instead of up to Canada. But this is, uh, yeah, part of the pipeline has already been built in the southern states. The uh, Energy Transfer Partners uh, has already built part of the pipeline. But I think the biggest issue that, you know, people also realize that uh, the, the cultural risk to the tribes is something that. Uh, can be understood. You know, when there's an issue like this, you need something that people can understand and wrap their head around when it comes to policy. I think that, uh, you know, the, government, the Obama administration stepped in and said the pipeline, you know, the federal judge said the pipeline construction could continue, 
But the Obama administration said, hold on, let's take a look at this part of the pipeline that's close to the reservation. We'll take a closer look. And a major part of the announcement was that they say the tribes need to be included more when there's development near their reservations that could affect their drinking water, that could affect, <clears throat> that could affect uh, their, you know, the tribal governments. So the Obama administration wants to make sure that the tribal governments are more involved. That is one of the, the major things that would come out of this uh, controversy. Has anybody brought up that it, it's kind of amazing that a, a group of impoverished people who have been pushed to the margins of American society are the only people to really stand up and stop pipeline companies. I remember uh, my family's from Arkansas, and I remember there was a big pipeline problem down there last year, and a lot of people have oil in their yards and under their yards and everything else because it broke. I mean, what's wrong with the rest of the country that they somehow think it's okay to put our drinking water in jeopardy? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline was originally going to be built near Bismarck, North Dakota, which is the state capital. But uh, officials were worried that it could contaminate the water supply. So they moved it near the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, where it could contaminate the water supply. And that apparently worried them less. So uh, you have to remember, there are only 5 million registered, there's 5.4 million registered Native Americans on the U.S. Census. That is 2% of the U.S. population. They have a very hard time asserting themselves. They have a very hard time getting attention for their issues, which is one reason I decided to do this uh, in-depth reporting, because, you know, journalists are supposed to find a story that isn't getting enough news coverage. So that's their biggest challenge. And since the 70s, they've gotten better at it. They've gotten a lot more legal advocacy. They've been better at influencing politics. But this is, you know, they're the smallest demographic in the country. And it, and it, and it matches, uh, you know, uh, something I see all the time, which is pollution is outsourced to people who are powerless and poor in their communities and their neighborhoods throughout the United States. Yeah, yeah, they have, uh, yeah, a lot of mining companies have been held accountable in recent decades for things that happened in the early 20th century, like with the uranium problem. Uh, some of those companies were held accountable by the EPA, and the EPA is still doing more to address that. There's still, you know, the tribes are still pressing for more compensation because they said, okay, you recognize that these companies were responsible, but look at all of the, the legacy of the problems that they were responsible for. We need more help. And that's that's continuing. So what are, what are the milestones that we're going to be looking for in the coming days and weeks in the Dakota Access Pipeline protest? And where do you think it can go? Because personally, for me, when I watch it, I think, are we seeing the beginnings finally of a real movement to protect our environment and our water and our air in this country. Yeah, well, one thing that could happen is uh, there's a protest planned in front of the White House tomorrow, and uh, President Obama has not made a direct comment about this. Uh, somebody asked him about the pipeline, and he said he wasn't able to answer it because he needed to learn more about it. So that's one thing that could happen. President Obama could make a comment about it. And Bernie Sanders may, like I said, he may make an appearance tomorrow in front of the White House in this protest. So. It's becoming a national issue. You know, celebrities are getting involved, politicians are getting involved. And uh, I think, you know, the, the Obama administration has said that they're going to invite tribal governments this fall to uh, be more involved in uh, reviews and development projects. That's a big thing that could happen if the tribal governments have, because of this, all this advocacy is on the national level, if they have more of a say in development that affects their reservations, that could be a big outcome. It's hard. I've, I've worked... Uh I, because I used to work in the wind power business, I, I had contact with some people from the Sioux and Lakota tribes, and, and you know, the idea was that they're like, we have enough land and, and wind that you could power most of the United States from here, and they had big plans for to take young people and recreate war parties, but instead of a war party, it's a maintenance party, and they go out and service everything. The problem is, it's getting the capital. It's getting the capital out of banks, out of support from the government, out of credits, in order to get this stuff built, and right now, they don't have the ability to do that. Yeah, yeah. like I said, it would be, it's simplistic to say that, it, you know, more money would fix everything. It wouldn't. You need, you know, to use the money wisely, yeah. and you need the will of the tribal governments also, because there's a big existential funk being a Native American. You are the smallest demographic in the country. You have a lot of uh, those generations of resentment and uh, guilt and bitterness 
And, uh, you know, they can, you know, the tribal governments need to inspire people. Like, I like the example of the war parties because they can, uh, you know, there's a really, really good novel that I like called Ceremony. It's about uh, a, a war veteran who comes home from World War II. He's a, a keen Indian. And uh, it's about, you know, it's about, you know, using your heritage to help you build a better future. Just accept where you're at, you know, and say, okay, I come from this great, Heritage. I'm going to use it to build a better future, and that's what the tribal governments can do. But to do that, they, you know, more money would definitely help. Mm-hmm. No, in, in complete agreement. I mean, looking at our record uh, of how we treated Native American tribes, especially that horrible time period between the, the 1890s and the 19 early 1970s, where it was forced assimilation and just general disrespect. Uh, it's nice to see tribes coming back now. Now, do you have some more to add on Dakota Pipeline, or can we transition real quick into something else that you've got some expertise in? Yeah, yeah. Keep an eye on the protests tomorrow. There's going to be protests in 35 states, and including in front of the White House. Uh, see what happens. How can people get involved with these protests if, if they think this is a big issue to stop? Well, the, there's, like, the internet movement is happening. There's, uh, one of the main hashtags is no DAPL, no Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, you can find a lot of people tweeting about that, celebrities, politicians, people have been posting articles about it. Uh, that's, that's one main way to get involved. Okay, great. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about something totally unrelated, cybersecurity, that, that you've worked on pretty extensively. Yes, uh, technology is my main focus, but this is a big story, so yes, technology. Okay, on this technology piece, how open to attack and vulnerable is the United States to cyber warfare? I think everybody is. I think that uh, people uh, need to realize that this, you know, all these gadgets we use, like computers and phones, and everything is becoming digitized. So everything is available on the cloud somewhere increasingly, and the Internet of Things is going to make that even more of a problem. Uh, companies are recognizing this, especially the financial sector. I think that your bank account and your online, your online banking is probably the safest uh, digital account you have. They've been taking it very seriously, but a lot of companies have not, and there's a lot of uh, reporting out there about how uh, unprepared companies are. They haven't been taking the steps at the executive level to say, okay, I'm in the boardroom and I'm going to talk about this cybersecurity problem. But, you know, they really haven't been doing that as much outside of the financial sector. But even, even in the financial sector, I've got some friends that used to be secret service agents that work in financial crimes and a couple that are VPs for cybersecurity for large banks. And confidentially, they've told me that the amount of money being stolen from the U.S. banking system is on par with the illicit drug market in terms of the size and volume of cash being taken out. I believe it. It's easy. It's easy money to take money notes for cybercrime is pretty easy. I hate using that term cybercrime because I think it dumbs down the conversation. I, I accept the word cybersecurity, but I think that, uh, yeah. We no, need to c- cybercrime, you think of <laughs> McDuff, the crime dog. I, I totally get it. Don't attach cyber to everything. But yes, it is important that you recognize that it is easy to do that because you're not there when the money is being taken. You can do it from Russia or China and you could do it and it's very hard to track you. And if you do get tracked, then people in Russia or China will probably not be extradited. So there's this, you know, feeling of invincibility among some hackers that this is, uh, well, this is a crime they can get away with. Mm-hmm. And how specific is it to, you know, Russia and China in particular, and how deep have they been able to penetrate into U.S. systems? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Russia and China have uh, reportedly been good at recruiting uh, criminal hackers from within their own countries. They find out that somebody's been hacking systems, or the, they've been doing online theft, and they say, "Hi, I'm a secret. I'm a I'm, I'm a secret agent, and I know what you've been doing, and I won't send you to prison if you do these favors for me once in a while." So that is how, uh, when you hear about Russia and China, China's government being involved, that's how they're doing it. They have these proxies that they employ uh, discreetly to do these uh, these these data breaches for them. And uh, there's a lot of that because, you know, people who uh, do uh, botnet attacks where they kind of patchwork attacks through di- networks in different countries so they become harder to track. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when, when looking at these attacks and directions in the recruitment, don't we also do the same thing where if an American is caught hacking that the government offers them a deal to work for them? 
Oh, I'm sure that the, the government and the intelligence agencies definitely want people with those skills. They want people who know how to get secrets. But uh, I, I've, I've spoken with former uh, spies, and including uh, former CIA director Michael Hayden, and he says that the USA uh, practices a code of conduct with their hacking. Military hacking, totally okay. Uh, President Obama and uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping made a no-hacking agreement uh, a few months ago, and military hacking is not included in it. You know, it is accepted. This is something that nations do for national security. But the U.S., according to people like Michael Hayden, have said that uh, the U.S. does not uh, attack private companies. They hold, they consider them civilians in the online war. They don't uh, hack private companies. They don't try to steal money. They don't try to steal information that is not related to national security. So that's how the U.S. differs. So the sense that the U.S. differs is once we've identified you and pulled you out, you're done robbing people. I'm, I'm not. Ex I can't exactly talk about how the intelligence agencies do that. I mean, I'm sure they talk with those people because they want to know how to do it. Uh, I cannot prove it, but I, uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, they, I'm they thinking, I'm thinking about that context. I'm thinking about the case in Florida a couple years ago where they had a. Oh, I can't remember this guy's name. He was a, a hacker that they caught, that they brought in, that they forced him to be a uh, informant, and then it wound up he was actually still hacking, even though he was working for the Secret Service. Oh, well, they've done that with hacktivists, too, yeah, like, um, yeah, the, yeah, the, the hacktivists who are involved with these groups um, are given deals, like, you know, inform on people who are doing this, and we'll, you know, lower your sentence, and we'll give you some, uh, you know, we'll, it'll, be, it'll count good against your record, mm -hmm. so there's that, for sure. And our grid, our power systems, are these safe? I think that they're more safe than people, some people will talk all the time about cyber Pearl Harbor is a term that has been used many, many times. And there is a risk. There is a risk that the uh, the power grid could be hacked. But I think that a lot of the power grid is, you have to remember, this is this will be a, pro a bigger problem as time goes on, as more and more systems are connected to the internet. But not all of them are. A lot of them are still run on traditional systems like the power grid. You know, you it's a, it's a risk. But I think a lot of systems are still run on traditional non-connected systems. It's becoming more and more connected. Uh, but I think that if, if they build it with that in mind, that it, it could be uh, compromised, then I think we'll be relatively safe. So in the next couple of years, we're going to have implantable connected devices in our bodies. Would you do that? No, I don't think I would. I don't, really, I don't even wear a Fitbit. I mean, I don't really need it. Uh, you have to think about the cost benefit of things like that. If it could... If you could implant something in your body that would tell you information that you absolutely need to make your daily life better, then that would be worth considering. Like, that's why wearables have not yet taken off as a huge consumer product. Like, the Apple Watch is the most advanced watch out there, but it's not their biggest selling product because people do not need it. Your smartphone already does a lot of the things that wearables do, if not more. So, if it gets to the point where it is a thing that you need, then it will be a bigger issue, but it's not. It's still getting there. Great. Is, is there anything you want to talk about a little more in depth? Uh, yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, the you know, one one important part that you mentioned about hacking was uh, the DNC hacks. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, yeah, Russia may be trying to uh, tamper with the election a little bit. They may not be trying to uh, trying to influence. They may be trying to collect intelligence. Uh, they may be trying to discredit the United States. Uh, it's also, I, I spoke to people like uh, former spies who have said that Russia has kind of a paranoid mentality. They feel that they need to steal information that might be publicly available. So, uh, you know, take that into consideration. You see news about the DNC hacks and uh, the release of the Clinton emails. It may be just that Russia is being paranoid and uh, that they're just, you know, they're just trying to uh, get a rise out of the United States to make themselves look powerful. That's what Putin does. Putin is all about projecting power. And, but I think and, that, I think and that using his opponents. Safe. Yes, definitely. I think our voting system is pretty safe. It's a risk that they could influence the voting, but I think that it's mostly just the, um, the, the Russians trying to project power and collect intelligence about who could be the future president. So you don't think it's a big threat for the fall election? It's a threat. I th you know, definitely, the, you know, the FBI has said with, you know, uh, they said there's a high degree of certainty that Russia's responsible for the DNC hacks. 
Uh, it, it's just, you know, you want, you like political news. I think that this is, uh, the biggest cybersecurity political news out there. You know, how is Russia trying to influence the election? I think that it's not as big of a threat as it could be. I think that, uh, it's, it's interesting that they are capable of doing this, that they're capable of going to the DNC, collecting their research database. And, uh, Arizona and Illinois have reportedly been targeted by Russian intelligence hackers also. But, uh, it would have to be an incredibly close election for them to influence the voting uh, to uh, turn the vote to one candidate or another, especially if they, if, you know, to be undetected. It's very difficult for them to do something like that and not get noticed. Mm -hmm. So, as, in terms of the threat, I mean, it's obviously not as much of a threat as the Chinese stealing all the uh, security clearance background checks from the CIA a year ago. Uh, yeah, well, it was, um, you know, the OPM. It was uh, the oh, officer, sorry, officer it, was, it wasn't just it was a lot of, I'm sure it was people connected with the uh, intelligence agency, but it was just all, all the federal government, a lot of, across the federal government, not just that. But yes, that, that was a bigger risk. I think that in this case, it's just Russia stirring up trouble. Uh, Russia trying to collect intelligence about who could be the future president, because the CIA does that too. The CIA collects information about, you know, politicians in other countries, but they don't need to steal it, because uh, a lot of it is publicly available, and Russia um, seems a bit paranoid. But uh, I think this is Russia projecting power and trying to just, just you know, make you know, make the United States look silly on the international stage. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that it could swing the election in a serious way. Especially, they would be detected doing that. They just would. They're just trying to stir up trouble. Okay. Okay. Well, Tom, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get some more from you in the next month or two and, and see where these protests go about the pipeline and what happens with the election and hacking. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? No, that's great. Thanks for, I had fun chatting with you. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. You've been watching TYT Interviews with Tom Risen. I'm host Wes Clark Jr. And thank you for joining us.